come to COP21, what's your primary function? I really have two roles here. One is I'm the science envoy for the U.S. State Department. Yeah. And the second one is I'm here as a faculty member at the University of California where I direct the Renewable and Appropriate Energy Laboratory that, direct, that works on a number of energy systems projects, yeah. largely in the renewable space, but we do look system-wide at evolving energy systems in Latin America, East Africa, and North America. And do you think um, a renewables plan schedule can keep us within the two to one limit? I do. If we start now, or if we started five years ago, it would have been easier, but the potential to build out not only new renewable capacity, but to retire fossil capacity is there. The challenge is that requires a combination of not only science, technology, engineering, which we basically have now. Mm -hmm. I'll come back to storage in a bit, but we basically have the generation side on a path to get there. But it requires evolution and innovation on the regulatory side, yeah. and that's much harder and much slower. And utilities and regulatory agencies across the world are moving far slower on that adoption process of an enabling policy environment than we would need. We would need things like a carbon price. We would need action beyond places like the European ETS, yeah. California's uh, cap and trade system, uh, British Columbia's carbon tax. We need more. We need other places to adopt the same. So the regulatory framework has to scale up for the, for the other stuff to fall into place? It does, and in, in very basic ways. We essentially have almost every utility in the world objecting to or dragging their feet on electrification of transportation. Right. And in my view, electrifying transportation is like adding massive numbers of new customers for those utilities. Yeah, yeah. But they find every reason to drag their feet and go slow. They find, oh, it's going to be expensive for the new substations. We'll need smart meters. We'll need all these things. And these are all true, but this is basically like saying, I choose not to innovate. Yeah. And I'm not interested in evolving to triple my demand. Every electric vehicle that comes on the market uh, on, online, that's like adding three homes or three small businesses. And so from my perspective, it's really been disappointing to see how difficult utilities have been to be on the lead edge. And their argument is that, you know, our regulators won't let us raise prices, it's very difficult. But if you make a compelling case to a regulator, whether it's in Norway or East Africa or California, you say, I choose to push electrified vehicles and therefore I need some rate increases to cover the costs, and I'll describe them in detail. That's a winning equation that utilities have consistently not adopted. Okay. Um, we're going to come back to the, to the COPs now. Um, these Marrakesh and, and up to 2020, these, these are the stepping stones between, between the sort of, you know, when, when things happen. And um, there's a lot of skepticism with the people I'm talking to around A, two degrees, but it's also this issue of negative emissions. Um, we can't draw the stuff down because we don't have the technology. We're heading for three, four, five, you know, like whatever. Well, I'd say there's two things. First of all, the, the cops are more like holding ponds than stepping stones. Okay. Because except for a very few examples, they've largely been status update meetings with almost no business sector, no banking participation. It's been very disappointing. Of course, Paris was exciting because we signed a great deal, and very much it was keeping with kind of the Paris city of romance. It was a great first date. It's not like making a marriage. And COP22 in Marrakesh and then the COPs to come are supposed to be COPs of action. That's what we require. Unfortunately, we have not seen enough muscle in terms of governments and private sector coming together to sign really major deals yeah. to highlight things like happened in, of all places, Kuwait which is setting up a two gigawatt solar and wind facility, Al Shagaya. We need that in, in, in Morocco, we need that in Kenya, we need that all across the Eastern United States, we need that in, in Asia. Those are the things that really make a difference. And so the cops are gonna to have to evolve to be much more business and deal oriented. Yeah. They are of course negotiator sessions, but what we have to now negotiate is deployment. If we get that, the two degree path is possible. If we don't get that, if we stay on this business as usual, then we put ourselves into greater and greater carbon debt, where we're going to need ultimately to find ways to get carbon out of the system. But in my belief, we have enough time to invest in what's a far 
less risky scientifically and technically path, and that is deploy efficiency and clean energy, and then wait and worry about what we must clean up later. But you're, you've got a lot of background in um, research into things like is it bioenergy capital. Right. My laboratory has studied biofuels in detail. We've written very widely used models of ethanol and cellulosic biofuels, and now BEC's a process where you might, on the one hand, use biofuels sustainably if we can, and that if is still to be proven, and then also bury carbon at the same time so that that cycle is carbon negative. And my lab has written a lot of papers on it, but I'm deeply skeptical that it is a workable technology relative to its competitors. So the, to the critics here, and people get their actually quite emotional about these subjects. They, they do, indeed. Yeah, they, they've got valid points. The, well, the valid point is that if we don't act, we are going to need to find ways to get carbon out of the system. But what I don't think is valid is the jump to think about carbon negative before we've really put our backs to the wheel on deploying clean energy. And what we found is that we were able to deploy clean energy much, much faster than the skeptics thought yeah. in places that engaged, in California, in Bangladesh, in Kenya, in Denmark, in Germany. It wasn't decades long, it was under a decade to really energize a transition. If that process is pushed ahead, we are likely to need some carbon energy. Let me say that clearly. We are likely to need some at the end to clean up our bureaucratic inefficiency. Yeah. But we'd be far better served by going so aggressively into clean energy that this package allows us to think about carbon negative systems, drawing carbon down as a little bit more of a luxury. But every day we delay makes it more of a necessity. Okay. You're coming from the science side, but you're also involved in some of the political side. One of the big themes is so obvious that this COP has been the American election and the noise is coming out of the, uh, the new administration coming in. Uh, is that just, how, what's your response to that? I mean, because nobody's got a clear idea, but. Well, I mean, everyone should be very worried, not just US citizens because the push towards a anti-science president and anti-science environmental protection agency would be not only bad for the climate story, but they would simply be stupid economics because the renewable energy process has already evolved so far that can you do great damage to it as president? Of course, it's the biggest economy, it's the biggest source of research and development, but to do that would be to step away from what pres of, of what Donald Trump campaigned on, and that is I want to be a populist present to bring jobs back to working class areas. Yeah. Those areas need battery technologies, they need electric vehicles, they need efficiency, they need smart sensors. It's investing in those things that will give us an immediate bump in the next five years. And if you're a president now, you want jobs now. Ne carbon negative technologies don't promise to do anything for decades. They may be needed. We might even need trillions of tons of drawdown. But they're not needed yet if we get on that clean energy path. Okay. One other thing I've heard people talk about is, can we do it without America? Well, I mean, you know, who if, knows? If it's the right. first case. You, know. well, you, can, you can do it without America in the sense that the rest of the world can clean up. But the U.S. is the biggest economy. Along with, it's second after China in emissions. It is number one in patents generated and new technologies created. And so whether you can truly do it without the United States, I don't believe you can. So we'll see where we get. Thank you very much, Dan.